in an earthquake, steel is at the top of the list, followed by timber, reinforced concrete, and lastly, mainstream. In Australia, we design buildings to handle earthquakes based on a set of rules from AS 1170.4. But here's the thing, the main goal of the code isn't to make buildings completely earthquake proof. It's all about keeping people safe. That means even though we do our best, buildings can still end up with some damage or even collapse in a big quake. However, there are some concepts that if understood and applied well, can help avoid or mitigate these damages. In today's video, we're gonna break down a few reasons why buildings collapse when the earth starts shaking. Let's start with the first one, inadequate distribution of lateral stability elements or irregularities. In the concept design phase of a building, typically a structural engineer will sit down with an architect and discuss the location of shear walls or bracings. This part is a big deal because as engineers, we want to maintain the center of stiffness of the building as close as possible to the center of mass while maintaining the architect's vision for how the building looks. Let's break this down. Center of mass is the point where you could stick one support under a big slab and it wouldn't tip over. It's all about finding that sweet spot to keep everything balanced, like a seesaw. In this example, since the building is symmetrical and there's no concentration of mass in any specific area, the center of mass is exactly at the center of the building. Another concept we have to understand is the center of stiffness or rigidity of the building. The center of stiffness refers to the centroid of the lateral stability system. In this example, the center of mass and stiffness are in the same spot because the walls are well distributed for the forces in X direction. If we start removing walls, the center of stiffness will shift towards where the walls are located, which is away from the center of mass. Now, here's why that's a problem. When an earthquake hits, the force acting on the center of mass will start twisting the building because of this eccentricity between the center of mass and the center of stiffness. And when we start twisting like that, some columns are gonna get pushed and pulled more than others. That extra pushing and pulling makes each floor move differently from the one above or below it. We call that difference in movement between floors interstory drift. And let me tell you, it puts a ton of stress on the columns, beams and connections, which can lead to big problems. It's a big problema how my nonna used to say. And remember that AS 1170.4 still requires an additional eccentricity of 0.1b to be introduced as per clause 6.6. .6. And just to give you a real life example, we're looking at a lift core of a building and the earthquake force in Y direction is causing shear in the X direction on this wall. Now you might be asking yourself, how a force in Y causes shear in X? And that's exactly because of the torsion or twisting of the building. Here's another big reason buildings can crumble during an earthquake. It's something called a soft story. Imagine this, in a building, one floor is way less sturdy than the ones above it. That's what we call a soft story. And usually if the horizontal stiffness of that floor is less than 70% of the one above it, we've got ourselves a soft story situation. Take, for example, a moment frame at ground level and shear walls higher up. If that moment frame gets all wobbly during an earthquake, while the shear walls stay pretty solid, you can bet there is gonna be some serious damage down below to the columns. Now, when it comes to designing for earthquakes, engineers need to be on top of all sorts of irregularities in the building. We're talking about stuff like wonky shapes, differences in weight distribution, and even how the shear walls line up vertically. There's a whole bunch of factors at play that you won't find in the textbooks. That's why understanding the load path, the path that the forces travel through your building is crucial. 
Next on the list is the construction material ductility and mass to strength ratio. Ductility basically means how much a structure can deform without breaking. Think of it like this paper clip. I can bend it this way and that, and it keeps on going without snapping. That is ductility. In the same way, a ductile building subjected to earthquake forces can bend, flex, or move significantly without abrupt failure, while a non-ductile or brittle material will fracture and crumble suddenly. When we look at building materials and how they hold up in an earthquake, steel is at the top of the list, followed by timber, reinforced concrete, and lastly, mansory especially unreinforced mansory. Even though timber comes second on this list, remember that timber is a brittle material. If you pull a piece of timber, it will eventually snap suddenly. However, the steel connections that join the timber parts can be detailed as ductile. The mass to strength ratio is also important because seismic actions are proportional to the mass of the structure. So if compared to steel and timber, reinforced concrete and masonry structures are heavier, therefore the seismic forces are also higher. Having said that, I would like to point out that steel structures are not immune from collapse during an earthquake event and well-designed and detailed reinforced concrete structures can perform as well as steel structures. Next on the list is something called short column effect. This phenomenon is frequently caused by the interaction of structural and non-structural elements. It is very common where a mid-height wall restricts the ability of the column to deform and only a fraction of its height can move laterally. There's a great article about it in the Professional Journal of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Jesus, that's a long name. And you can find it online. And here's a video where you can see the short column effect in play. When this occurs, the shear force within the columns get a lot stronger compared to the other columns with their full height intact. Therefore, extra shear reinforcement should be installed or a joint to separate the column from the non-structural element. Obviously, if you choose to isolate the wall from the column, you still have to ensure the out of plane stability of the wall. It has to be connected in some way, otherwise you just push the wall and it falls over. Next is connection detailing. You've probably heard the saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Well, the same goes for buildings. Even if you've got a column or a beam that's super sturdy against earthquakes, it won't mean much if the connections holding everything together aren't properly designed and detailed. And on the flip side, a building with well-designed connections can handle seismic forces way beyond what it was originally built for. Now there's a ton of information out there about how properly reinforce and detail connections, but here's my two cents. First, when it comes to seismic loads, the forces travel through the building's diaphragm and get resisted by the shear walls. So to me, it makes sense to pay special attention to the connections of the slab and these walls. If the architecture calls for voids around these walls, you might run into trouble because there's barely any room to make a solid connection between the wall and the slab. Remember how I mentioned earlier that if a building center of mass isn't lined up with its center of stiffness, it will start to twist during an earthquake. Well, that means these connections not only have to handle lateral forces, but also the push and pull caused by this twisting. And here's one last thing to keep in mind. When the building starts shaking, the bending moments will also change and result in extra internal forces that must be considered. So you might have worked out the reinforcement embedment of a beam into a column, but in an earthquake event, the reversal moments might require a longer development length. And if you don't know what development length is, watch this video in my channel called Reinforcement Bars in Concrete, How Deep Should They Go? Last one on the list is soil failure. 
The type of soil in which the earthquake waves travel will influence a lot the design. Weak soil and groundwater are a couple of factors that influence the amplitude of the ground motion. You can construct two buildings exactly the same, but if they're sitting in different soil types, during an earthquake, the levels of damage can be completely different, even though the buildings have exactly the same structure. There's also a huge problem called liquefaction of the soil, which is a condition where the soil assumes a quicksand-like condition under the actions of an earthquake. This can completely undermine the stability of a building. Remember, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. So whether you are an architect, builder, or an engineer, understand the seismic rules in your area and pay attention to all these items I explained in this video. And please don't make the mistakes I've made as a structural engineer that I show in this video here.